the demo is going to, uh, I mean, if I were to right now pull a Joe Pro and try to like make a painting in like four hours, you know, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> because I'm, uh, first of all, I think it would be antithetical to what I've been talking about regarding light and uh, its history and the history of form. Uh, so I'd, I, I actually would like to um, walk through a, a, a way of ways of beginning um, a picture. I think I, I, a lot of people I notice not, not that I didn't have the same problem. I did have this problem. It took me a while to get a handle on it. But uh, the transition between drawing and painting uh, is a big problem. Uh, you, know, you see people that draw very well, but then when they go to paint, they freak out. And color starts going all over the place and mixing in ways you don't want it to mix. And how, how, when, do you, when do you let it dry? How long do you let it dry? Uh, when do you, what do you do when you start back into a picture after it's dry? Um, you know, um, the transition from, uh, from, the, from drawing or your underpainting to everything you do on top of it. When you talk about an underpainting, first of all, an underpainting is frankly nothing more than what you do first on the canvas, you know? So if you, if you have like an idea that there is some magical old master way of doing it. There, there were many different ways of doing, starting the picture uh, underneath. Probably the worst way to start a picture underneath is to do a black and white underpainting. Uh, a lot of people think of that Ang um, uh, Odalisk that's in the Metropolitan Museum that's done with just black and white. And people, I, I know I've had many friends and students say that's got to be how he started his pictures with a gray underpainting, you know, just simply black and white. And that, that, that painting was not done as an underpainting at all. That probably was done for engraving or just as an exercise or just to show his students the thing that he always asked them to do, which is uh, he would tell them to, t to take white and black and make, uh, you know, 100 val or 50 values between white and black. And they would come back and they say, we can't, we can't do it. And then he would pull out something that, that, had 500, that he did that had 500 values between white and black. Um, and he said that you, know, you know, that you should paint a portrait like a fly crawling across a piece of paper. You know, that's how you're paying attention to value shift. You know, it's so subtle. And, and, and that's how he got these amazing uh, subtleties in his, in his work uh, of tonality. Uh, but black and white is not the way to start the uh, underpainting. The underpainting is, uh, I find that the best way to do it is to do what you might call a chromatic grisaille, which is uh, a grisaille or an underpainting that takes into account from the very beginning uh, a shift in the temperature from the temperature of the light to the temperature of the shadow, first of all, and indicates to some degree um, local color and some kind of, you know, like that. But holding off on the full uh, expression of the color, holding off on the full intensity of the color, holding off on the full intensity of the darks, okay? You can go as powerful with, as, with the lights as, as you want to go, in the underpainting. You're probably better off doing that. Um, another thing that people tend to do is they, um, they see a warm light on, on the model, for example, uh, and they start mixing up the yellow right away <laughs> to get that yellow light on there. And uh, in the beginning, you don't want to do that, you know? Uh, I can't imagine Vermeer going in there and start slamming in the blues or slamming in the, in the very beginning of the painting. You're going to gradually build to the full, full expression of the color, okay? And it, while you're doing that, you're building into the, the picture illumination. Now, you know uh, how it feels when you take a white canvas and you put color directly on it, how that color sings. And then 
you work on a more toned ground, you put the color on it, it has a different effect, you know? And then as the painting gets darker, you put that same color on it and it starts to not even look like the color. It's very, it kind of deadens, right? So the object in, in painting is always to keep as much light, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and I think in, you know, in methods that have existed for centuries, is to keep as much light in the picture as long as possible before you start enhancing the darks and the color. Um, it's so much more effective uh, uh, if you do that. Color sings with a greater, you know, uh, with a greater voice when, when, you, when you do that. Um, in maybe the, the uh, ancient works of, uh, of the, um, the um, hi, um, you know, the Dutch, the, um, I'm sorry, the uh, Flemish masters, you know, the white of the ground was very important. And uh, they tried to preserve the whiteness of the ground throughout the picture. They, that's not to say they didn't layer over that ground with a glaze and then pull, pull other whites on top of that. But uh, in the end, their darks tended to be thicker than their lights. Uh, if when they analyze the paints, the darks have a kind of thickness to them that the lights don't have because they're trying to preserve that ground coming through, but they don't mind putting the darks in. You know? But in, in painting, in more modern painting under like Titian, the, the, the lights are more, more pronounced than the darks. The darks are thinner than the lights. And uh, in people like Titian, um, you get the idea that instead of just trying to preserve this whiteness and letting that be the, the basis for the light mass, they're actually putting the white, the light where they want it to be. You know, so they might have used it to, started with a toned ground uh, of some sort and then worked, probably worked with, with tempera in the beginning, even Titian in his early paintings. But if you look at Titian's late paintings, um, you see um, that he's hitting the whole canvas with white. Flicking, flickering, flickering the whole surface of the picture with this white lead, you know? And uh, some of them are unfinished, and you look at them and you think, what is this, snow, or why are these dots of light all over the place? And most likely, he was putting that light there with the intention ultimately of, uh, uh, ultimately of later glazing over it. So he's trying to put back into the picture light where he wants it to be, and then letting it dry, and then glazing over it. You know what I'm saying? So in modern painting, then you put the white where you want it to be. Uh, and so the whites tend to be thicker in the end than, than the glaze of the darks. Um, so when you begin a painting, generally when I begin paintings, I work on an amber ground. Um, almost all the time. I find amber to be a color that, uh, that, uh, that uh, can take lots of different movements to to, to cooler or neutral, and then in the other way to, to warm. Um, the other thing that's odd about uh, painting is that it's a little bit like uh, sailing down a river, you know? It's not like you, you don't go straight down the river, you know, you tack, they call tacking. You, you go to, one, you know, you use the wind to take you to one side, you change the sail, you use the wind to take you to the other side, you use the cell, so to the other side, that's how you get up the river, you don't go straight up. And so um, in painting, also there's this sense that you can start the painting and it'll look cool, and then pour glaze over the whole thing and then it'll all look warm, and then you rework it again when that's dry, and when you put the lights on it, it'll look cool again with some warmth now, and you move like that. So you don't like immediately head for hot, for warm, or, and you're better off starting the underpainting in, in a rather cool way. Um, you know, people stay away from white because they're afraid of making paintings look chalky. And some teachers even say, get rid of that white, because they don't really understand what makes a chalky painting. White doesn't make a painting chalky. You know, or even uh, I'm going to change my white and get a white that's not as chalky as another white. That's not what does it. There's only one reason that paintings look chalky, and that's when you have coolness in the light 
and a similar coolness in the shadow. That's what makes a chalky painting, nothing more than that. If you don't have a, diff a shift between the temperature of the light and the temperature of the shadow, you're going to get chalk. If you glaze the whole thing, or if you use warmth in the lights and warmth in the shadows, you're going to get what, what becomes muddy. Okay? So the, the shifts between, um, between uh, uh, the temperature and the light become crucially important in, in making a picture. The other thing that, I mean, um, I, I don't mean, I, I, I need to talk about this stuff before I even begin to show you something, because I'm not going to show you, you know, a masterpiece in the making, uh, but I'm going to try to explain to you certain ways of, of, of merging or sort of bridging the gap between drawing and color, okay? Because that seems to be a huge problem all the time, everywhere. All right. Okay. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Something very important about the distribution of cools and warms over a form, or the distribution of cools and warms over a, a, a light mass of the painting, okay? You have to stagger the temperatures. What the hell's that? <laughs> I didn't ask for that. <laughs> okay. You, no, that's cool. I, you're all right. You're okay. Just bear with us for a while. We're, okay. The staggering of temperature within the, uh, within the light mass is really important. The optics of illumination, which is really codified in a sense by, by Caravaggio, and it becomes a very important Baroque conceit in painting, uh, and uh, it, it is some, goes something like this. Now, it's not that people didn't understand this. I mean, obviously, Titian understood this very clearly. Leonardo understood it. People understood this, but it, 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 it reaches a kind of uh, almost uh, militant pitch in Caravaggio when he's sort of turning his back on mannerism and trying to, again, reassert the order of painting in uh, what I would call a Neoplatonic way. Because he, in Neoplatonism, I think I was speaking about how the vanishing point uh, and the creation of perspective was by a group of Neoplatonists, the vanishing point, uh, and when you look at a picture with a vanishing point, orthogonals and traversals, your eye is forced to look at the point of infinity. It's very hard to look at a perspectival grid and not see an illusion of space, right? Uh, so if your eye is being forced to this point of infinity, what would be the point of forcing your eye to, to, to this, this point, you know? The point is to uh, establish a corridor that exists between man and the infinite. Uh, and uh, it is a demonstration, therefore, of uh, what is a Neoplatonic idea about the soul's flight to the, to the ineffable, to the one. It, it becomes Christianized in the Renaissance, but before that it was Plotinus who actually invent, uh, developed the idea of Neoplatonism. That's where it comes from. It's not Plato, it's Neoplatonism, and it's Plotinus in like, a, I think, 100 or 200 AD that develops this notion. It's actually a way of bringing the whole world uh, together, um, that these divine eminences that flow like a fountain, the top of a fountain, to Earth, you know, uh, and then uh, arrive here contaminated, and we see these things in objects on Earth in their contaminated form, but we recognize something in them that brings us back to the, to the, the source of it all, which is, in Plotinus' terms, the ineffable one, okay? And the one has to be a one. It can't be divided. There's no division within infinity, within a one. A one has no division. So the one, then, that they're referring to is truly infinity. You know, because in infinity, you know, there is no, uh, it, there, there, there is no difference. There's only one. And in infinity, um, um, there, there's the greatest power. It's a mystery to us logically because there is no, uh, there, there are paradoxes within it. You know, because if it's only one, then the maximum maximum is the same as the minimum minimum because you can't have a bigger and a smaller. It's all one. 
So the maximum, the, the biggest big is equal to the smallest small. You know, and these kinds of things troubled philosophers um, at the end of the Middle Ages, before the Renaissance, and it was always sort of present within Neoplatonic thought, um, which uh, uh, I, I, Augustine was a Neoplatonist, but you know, in, in the end, toward, in the Middle Ages, Aristotelian thought took hold. And so it wasn't until early in the Renaissance with the birth of humanism that people began to reassess Aristotle's thinking and to start thinking more in terms of the Platonic. And Neoplatonism entered into Italy, you know, and, and spread throughout Europe. Neoplatonism is not just a, a, you know, this a Renaissance idea, it's, it goes throughout Western culture for centuries afterwards, you know. When, uh, when uh, Keats writes, Ode to the Grecian Own, uh, <laughs> Ode, to the Greece, Ode to the Grecian Urn, you know, he's speaking about truth and beauty as being conjoined, you know. And uh, truth and beauty being conjoined is a Neoplatonic conceit, that the ineffable one is the pinnacle of both truth and beauty. That comes from Plato. Um, so perspective is, is a machine that forces your eye to this point of infinity. In mannerism, things sort of, uh, artists began to say, I, I am not merely imitating the world, I'm actually painting what's in my brain, my mind, because we're now, we're intellectuals, we're not just simply craftsmen that paint, you know, things the way they look, you know? That's why mannerist figures become elongated and distorted, and they just don't care. They know how to do it, but they don't want to do it that way. They want to prove this point. When Caravaggio comes around, so perspective then goes out the window, and Neoplatonism takes a different, an inward sort of fate, uh, 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 it goes to an inward phase, like the, the subjective of the artist. When Caravaggio emerges on the scene for a number of different reasons, and I won't go into in, involving the Counter-Reformation in the Catholic Church, he reasserts this relationship with, uh, uh, of the individual with infinity, okay? But he does it not by driving the eye deep into the picture, to the vanishing point, but having the flash of the reflection off the surface of a form or off the, uh, from the center of a light mass back to the eye of the viewer, you know? A corridor of light comes into the scene and flashes back to you. So this is where Baroque begins, where the picture starts to emerge out of the frame rather than be, be behind the window as it was in early Renaissance, okay? Um, the placement of that, that reflection becomes very important. Now, we know that privilege is monocular vision. And, you know, if you've been on a lake with the moon there, with all your friends on the lake, you know, you don't see the reflection of the moon going to your friend. The reflection of the moon comes to you. And when you move over, it comes to you. You move over and it comes to you. So reflection of that nature privileges uh, the monocular vision, just like linear perspective does. So you see it, it becomes an analog for linear perspective. And the vanishing point is an analog for the vanishing, the incidence of reflection is an analog for the vanishing point. And it reestablishes a corridor between man and the divine. Because light was believed to be traveling at an infinite rate of speed. So you're, dealing, you're partaking in infinity through the reflection of light. Even Descartes thought that, even as late as Descartes, he, he said I, he staked his entire philosophy on his belief that light was traveling at an infinite rate of speed. Of course, no, now we know it's not traveling at an infinite rate of speed, but it had a powerful effect on reestablishing this corridor, this Neoplatonic corridor between what's on Earth and what uh, is in infinity in the divine. Okay, so I say this because when people paint figures illuminated to show off the form, this is where it's coming from. It's not as if they didn't do that before in the Renaissance, but they insisted upon the organization of the light mass to demonstrate space, figures in space, and also to reinforce this idea that form itself, that drawing of the form, was the highest achievement of the painter because the painter then is partaking in, in, in sort of divinity by making a form that is receiving the reflection, like a vanishing point. So figures in space in linear and quattrocento perspective, you know, 
are, are magical and the artist is godlike because he can make these things seem to be almost like pilgrims moving to infinity. And when you look at a, a linear perspective piece, you partake in the pilgrimage to infinity, okay? Along with these figures in the, what Alberti would call the, uh, the historia. Though that's the, whatever the figures are doing in the picture is the historia. Um, so, um, in the classical model, okay, oh, this is terrible. This is a Bristol, Bristol board. You can disastro. Ma che cazzo hai fatto? E Bristol board non ci usa e non serve, hai capito? Non fa bene. All right, va bene, fa bene. I'm going to paint, actually, what? No, I was just asking if that meant there's a way to keep the projector on. What the hell is that? <laughs> Technical <laughs> stuff. <laughs> All right. Oh. I'm going to actually paint on the, 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 the cover of the Bristol board uh, pad, which I, uh, it takes the charcoal there. <laughs> Okay, but I want to show you that in the classical model that was established by Caravaggio, there are four zones of light. Okay? Uh, and you may have seen this model over and over again. This is a classical model. There is a romantic model that uh, shows, can, I can draw that will demonstrate the deconstruction of, of form by Delacroix, you know? But in this model, um, you have four, four zones. This is Caravaggio, and, and it becomes the model for the Baroque. It's not just on a torso, remember. It's not just on a form within the space. Uh, it's, it's over the entire picture. So the Martyrdom of St. Matthew by Caravaggio actually demonstrates this, and they all demonstrate it. The Las Meninas demonstrates it, The Night Watch by Rembrandt. You have got these sort of, uh, these uh, areas of the light mass which is organized, and then you have the turning around it, and then you have the shadow beyond it. So you've got a light mass, light mass, okay, which tends to be warmer, okay, warmer. Okay, you've got the turning, which tends to be cooler, right? Then you've got the shadow, which we're gonna say tends to be neutral. I'll say neutral because if you have a warm light mass, a neutral shadow will look cool. If you have a cool light mass, the neutral shadow will look warm. So you can get the shift without going from yellow to blue in the coolness, okay? So um, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't see it, but uh, then there's, there's this, which is the incidence of reflection. People call it the highlight, but I don't like the word highlight because it just looks like the light gets lighter, 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 lighter. The important thing about it is that it changes temperature from the light mass. It's cool again. So you see the effect you're getting when you're sort of, you start to stagger the temperatures. It gives you, it makes, there's so many paintings you see that are supposedly done by people who are incredibly good at drawing. The School of Florence, and you see this among students of Peter Anagoni, and you see it in these ateliers and stuff. Sometimes you see it's beautifully drawn, but it looks like it's plastic. It's like they drew Gumby or something, you know? It's like flesh does not reflect that way. Objects don't reflect, don't, don't look that way. There's this constant pattern of warm and cool moving through it. And it's a very confusing pattern if you don't sort of break it down into its simple components. So when you, this kind of model, you know, we don't see it all the time. When I look around me right now, I don't see this model. I see everyone's sitting in half light right now. So I'm seeing, you know, what Delacroix would bring into the discourse when he deconstructed this model that showed all form, and he privileged color. I can show you that in a minute. But the, the uh, and people didn't walk around in the old days with a light strapped to them at 45 degrees. So every time you saw them, it was like, hello, madam. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Sir. And so every time you looked at them, you saw this model, you know. 
and that's clearly played out. And yet portraits were always done this way. You know, paintings were done this way. And why were they done this way? Obviously, they walked around and they saw what I'm seeing, but they didn't paint that. Is it because they didn't have photography? No, it's not because of that, because this model privileges drawing. It privileges form. It privileges tonality, okay? Which from the birth of perspective became the intellectual calling card of the artist. It gave the artist, it was the, it was the, the further demonstration of the worthiness of the artist as linear perspective was. You have to understand that artists were like, were like craftsmen. Actually, they are like we, we are now. They were like, you know, nothings. Nothings in society, you know, until you become rich and famous. Then you're something. You know, are you a successful artist? Well, what do you mean? I, I did some successful painting. said, no, are you, are you making money at it? Well, no. Well, forget about it. And they want to talk to the person who's making money or the successful artist. It's bullshit. It's total bullshit. But the rise of the artist from the working, sort of the work, working person, the crafts person, who was anonymous during the Middle Ages into these sort of celebrity figures. They weren't just celebrities. They were also striving to, be, to enter into the seven liberal arts to be accepted as intellectuals. So when they invented perspective, this was the way they could show everyone, not only are we ph philosophers, we're also mathematicians, and we're also sort of creating an aid to religion, as Alberti said. You know, so why not let us into the liberal arts? You know what the liberal arts are, right? The liberal arts are, in the, in the universities in the past, there were like seven liberal arts. And it was astronomy, rhetoric, grammar, I think, uh, uh, mathematics, um, um, philosophy. There were, th th these were the liberal arts that anyone who went to school to study through the universities in, in uh, Pisa or in Bologna or in, uh, in France uh, would study the liberal arts and they would become, they would become masters of the liberal arts, right? doctors of the liberal arts. But painters were always excluded from that. You know, music was one of the liberal arts, but painting wasn't. Poets were not ex allowed into the liberal arts comes from an old stigma from Plato. But so when artists invented perspective, this was their, their moment. Now let us in. So a lot of the artists actually tried to get into the liberal arts, tried to petition to be Piero della Francesca, Mantegna, Leonardo himself, you know? The, even as late as the father-in-law of, of Velasquez tried to, to, you know, get into the liberal arts. And the, the justification for their applications to the liberal arts was always drawing because, but never color, because drawing was stable, determinate, predictable, measurable. Therefore, it had a kind of rational component that would appeal to the rational, logical people of the liberal arts, you know? They never would say, well, color, because we can mix amazing colors, we, we should be admitted, because color was considered ephemeral, not important which we know is ridiculous now. We know it's ridiculous now. In fact, it's actually ridiculous that we're even in the liberal arts at all. You're probably better off here than being <laughs> at a university where you'll be ghettoized again. Um, so when I show you the model that I'm going to start to demonstrate for you is uh, based on a classical model, and it's going to uh, uh, attempt to show you how uh, it can be possible to make uh, to deal with warm and cool without overmixing colors that don't play well together and turn into muddiness or chalkiness. Okay, that's a big problem in painting. Um, so I'm going to show you at a certain point how you can make a blue with nothing but warm colors, you know, which you probably know how to do to a certain extent, but I'm going to show you how simple that is and how it reinforces the idea that a continuous skin from light mass to turning uh, to shadow eventually can, can be done without trying to sort of, in the beginning of your painting, that, that is, start to mix these planes of color, okay? You can start in this way. I'm going to work on the, a rougher piece of paper because um, the charcoal's not taking to this. But then I can work on the Bristol board to show you a different way of approaching this. Um, okay, I need a chair. What's that?
Do you have Strathmore? Thick, thicker Strathmore? That's right. Don't worry about it. I, I use this. Is, this is this will be fine. Okay. Um, and our model. We'll set up set up a, a simple pose. This is not going to be a Joe Pro. Joe Pro. Did you ever see um, Art Confidential? Yeah. Right. The movie. But have you ever seen the cartoon that it's based on? The comic. It, it, they're like a five-page comic that is hilarious. Far better than the movie. And it's all, the movie was actually based on this little thing, Art Confidential. And, uh, you know, he goes through the kinds of characters you meet in art school, and then one of the characters is Joe Pro. He goes, I'm sorry, I'm late for class. I was just finishing an assignment for blah, blah, blah. You know? This guy who comes to class, I'll let everybody know he's like already working in the field, you know. Or the guy who blah, blah, blah says, when I was talking to so-and-so at the Whitney, he said blah, blah, blah. You say it in front of some other person until so they go, oh, you know. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, that's fine for now. I mean, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to try to paint from the front. Okay. okay. Um, and actually, uh, a little bit to the light. Okay. Uh, a little less to the light. Okay. I'm trying to see. To see. Okay, so in beginning the picture, in any, whenever, if I'm looking at the model, the first thing I'm going to ask myself is what is the temperature of the light? Okay, crucially important. Not that I'm going to immediately start painting the temperature of that light, but I just want to know, get an idea where the temperature of the light's going. And then I want to say, then what is the temperature of shadow? Would you take um, this arm, put it, put it more, no, no, I'm sorry, just, just like that, and take the other arm and put it like that. Okay, that's good. Oh. Sorry for the light being so bright right now, but. No problem. Okay. So the light is warm. The turnings have a coolness to them. We can actually accentuate the, the, um, the, sh the difference between these things by flashing something into the shadow mass. Do you see what happens to the shadows? You know, if I use the yellow. You see the, do you see the temperature shift of the shadows? But look at the light. Nothing happens to the light. The light remains the same, but the shadows change. This is a very important thing, because what it's showing you is the, the, the authority of the light mass, the stability of the light mass, as opposed to the wantonness of the shadows. They go wherever they want to go depending on what's reflected back into them, what's near them. And Delacroix, what Delacroix said is that if you make the whole subject of the painting, the shadow mass and the half-light, then that's where all the reflected light happens, reflected color happens, you see? So that's why he deconstructed the model of form. Moreover, f form demonstrated this way, for example, in the school of David, you know, was an authority, was totalitarian. It dominates, the, it dominates the thing you're painting. It doesn't allow for the reflection of, of uh, color. You see? So if you want to put it in political terms, you could say that the light falling upon the form colonizes the form. It sort of overtakes the form. And the form then can do nothing but reflect the brilliance of the light or partake of the brilliance of the light. And every reflective propensity that would exist in this half-light situation that I'm seeing when I'm looking at you is, is forced, crowded to a ghetto of shadow. See what I'm saying? You understand that? So if you think of it anthropomorphically or you think of it politically or you think of it in sort of social terms, then you kind of understand how artists begin to allegorize the whole system. 
Like light then becomes an allegory of, of, of uh, political dominance. Shadows become actually a place of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of rebellion, of uh, insurgency, you know? And among the shadows, of course, you've got a, multiple, a multiplicity of, of groups, of different political groups vying for attention within the shadow mass. And those are the different things that, that, you know, that reflect in the shadow mass, you know? You might have like this going on up there, and then you might have this going on down there. You see? So you've got this sort of like these, these warring factions within the shadow mass that are uh, kept in control by the glory of Rome, you know? You could have Pal people in Palestine or people in other parts of the Roman Empire that sort of the Romans allow to have their customs and things like that, but they have to give, pay homage always to Caesar, right? Caesar is the light mass, okay? So when you think of it in these terms, it becomes actually, first of all, easier to remember. And secondly, you understand that these things become issues for painters. These things are not just replications of what people see. These are kind of you know, intellectual models that are at war with each other, you know? They become allegorized. They turn into allegories. The method is allegorized. And it goes all the way through, you know, if Delacroix's, if Delacroix's half-light is, uh, is a gray day, as I said, I don't know if I said it in the lecture last night, but you know, Picture should be structured as started as if on a gray day, meaning a half light, and then you stick a light into it, you have lights and shadows, but the guts and glory of the picture should be, according to Delacroix, the half light, and you see that in Impressionism. You never see a form like this, uh, a form like this painted by an Impressionist. They would never set something up like this. They would set something up so it privileged the color and reflection of color. And in order to do that, you have to look carefully into shadows and half lights and privilege those over the form. And that's one of the reasons why Impressionism flattens. The canvas flattens, okay? And eventually in modernist painting, the flatness of the canvas becomes very important. The pure interaction of color, right? Um, all right. So, when we look at the model right now, it's very easy to see everywhere the light is striking her as being the same. It's very easy to see it as, as the same. Light is striking the body, and everywhere it's striking, it's almost the same color. But that's not our job, you know? You can get everybody off the street and tell them to draw the model and they'll make an outline and then they'll take a flesh color, whatever flesh we're talking about, and paint it, the whole thing that color, right? And you look at it, it's just sort of this outline with flesh color or some flesh color through it. You, you've seen it, you know, people, little kids do it all the time. But our job is not to look at that. And our job is to differentiate, especially in the light mass. You have to look carefully into it to find these differences that that model showed you, okay? So you have a light mass, you have a turning, and you have a shadow. When I do that, you see the, the turning takes it on a grayness, but the shadow has a different character to it? I'm sorry. Do you see how the turnings are gray? The shadows are of a different thing. They could be, I say neutral because they could be this or they could be this, depending on what's next to them. So if you make them neutral, you'll be, you'll be better off in terms of change, flipping, the, changing their color, depending on whatever's next to them, okay? When you're inventing a, a figures in a space, for example. Um, so we have the light mass, we have the turn of the shadow. Now let's find the incidence of reflection, which is very hard to see at times, but we know has, has to be there. Look for it in the highest light, and also look for it in the largest mass. There are going to be reflections here, and the glistenings on the nose, things like that. But you want to look for it in the largest mass of the light. So the largest mass of the light is the torso. And if you look 
very, very carefully, squinting even, where it becomes cooler. Coming down in here into the side. That sort of, there's a, okay, think of it as a topo map, you know? You find the lay. I see people when they, they're drawing a lot from photographs and in their drawings, First of all, I, I, I think that it's a real mistake to actually copy, when you're working from a projection, to work with, a, with line, linearly. I don't think you should do that. I think you should try to just recognize where the masses of light and shadow are, and with a larger brush, with, even with a, a wash of acrylic or something, lay in those things, okay? I wouldn't like start tracing outlines around and then looking inside of it and trying to do this topo map thing where cha things change. It's, that's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. It's going to ruin the experience of painting for you. You want to get to the issue as soon as possible, so start painting it as soon as possible. When you paint it, work from general to specific. You know, Don't work from the specific to the general. So ignore eyelashes. Ignore you know, uh, the tiny little changes that go on for, for the time being when you're starting the picture. So can you, and, and the other thing is that if the light is finding you, but look at where the light in, on the legs sort of dims. And look at the redness of the legs. You know, and start asking yourself, why is it that color? Why it's dimmer because there's less light on it. And if there's less light on it, then it can, it, it, the reflective propensity of that area starts to grow. Less light, more reflection. So you're seeing the reflection of the red cloth where the light is less strong. Do you see the grayness in the forehead on that side? Why is it gray? Because the room is gray. When, do you see the, the shadow on that arm looks like is that color? And look at the shadow cast by the breast and by the arm on this and on the leg. It's red. Why? Because the light's bouncing off the form and flooding back into the shadow. The warmth of the light is flashing right back into the shadow, and therefore it, it becomes red. Because the shadows are mirrors. They just are waiting to reflect anything that's near it. But on this side, there's an overabundance of grayness to the side, and there's no real light over there flashing back in unless I put the card there. And so the shadows want to be a, a reflection of the grayness of this room. When you start getting down lower, they get red because of the redness of the sheet on the, that she's standing on. I do a memory lesson, and what I do is I have the models pose, and people look at it, and we analyze it like this. And then I send the models away, and people begin their paintings. And then they work on the paintings for about 45 minutes, and then the model comes back, they put their brushes down, and they look at the model. right? and compare what they've done to the model, and then the model goes away and they begin painting again. So forcing them to paint out of their imagination, forcing them to look very carefully to record what's going on here. Okay? All right, now, um, when I paint, uh, do studies, I usually use shellac on paper. Um, and the shellac that I use is generally an amber shellac. Shellac you can buy it in a hardware store and it's either, you can get a clear and an amber shellac. All right? Um, and I begin different ways. One way I might begin is to start with some kind of drawing. Um, when I work on paintings, I do not start with charcoal because I don't like the blackness of the charcoal. But in this, for this, for expedience sake, I'm going to be, look at that, oh. <laughs> for expedience sake, I'm going to, so, and I'm just gonna focus on the torso, okay, so we can see the mass here. Joe Pro. <laughs> so now, 
the other thing that's sort of weird about this is that I, um, I intentionally, when I work, you know, don't focus on making the drawing as accurate as I possibly can. Uh, because I want to leave, I, I want to be able to correct as the painting evolves. So I'm always focusing on the evolution of the painting. And if the drawing is so correct, I'll be constrained. I always think, oh, I went out of the line, or, you know, it should be. So I actually know that I can keep correcting the drawing as the painting goes on. I get a general sense of what it, what it is, you know, but I'm not like, you know, going to make an ang drawing and then color it. I'm thinking volumetrically. All right, let's see how this, this plays out. So I get it like this. Could you put your hair on the other side, that hair on the other side? Yeah, thanks. That's good. He's had enough. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Can't take this guy anymore. Got it. Got it. <laughs> I'm out of here. And to tell you the truth, when I would do a drawing like this, it would be a sloppy. In fact, I'm going to show you, again, a different way that I would approach it that would be probably happier for me, because I really don't like working uh, li linearly that much uh, anymore. I don't care how smudgy, how off it is, I'm going to wind up correcting with my paint. Let's see this. No, I'll tell you, I should, is there an eraser here? Do we have an eraser?
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to really just focus on the torso, so I want to uh, get this in as soon as I can. Now I'm actually realizing why going out after dinner last night until the wee hours of the morning <laughs> was perhaps not the best idea. Uh, sadder but wiser. So I'm sure you've seen Joe Prose at this doing a much better drawing than I have, but I don't really care because, frankly, I want to, I want to paint. I don't want to draw this thing. I'm, I'm not going to make a, a very fine drawing and then ruin it by just having to paint on it. You know, if I... What time is it? How are we doing for time? Okay, A remarkably stiff looking figure out there.
Okay. <clears throat> okay. I don't want to like you know, I could spend another five hours establishing, you know, a drawing. Uh, but I'm going to now take this. You can take a break now, dear. Um, I'm going to take this and I'm going to put shellac on it. But the, um, if you take a charcoal drawing and you brush the shellac on with a brush, you're going to smear your charcoal drawing. But if you pour the shellac on it and with a card or like a, uh, a putty, putty knife, plastic putty knife, just draw the shellac over the charcoal, it won't disturb the charcoal. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, where can I do, uh, where can I pour the shellac? Should I pour it, I don't want to pour it on this model stand, but I need a, um, I need a card, uh, or you know, give me a piece of cardboard that I can bend and just drag. Oh, yeah, are you gonna use that? I mean, do you need that anymore? Uh, no, no, it's your card for school. What's that? I use the open locks. So you don't need this anymore? But it's your scorecard. Okay. <laughs> okay, so are you watching now? So I'm just gonna pour this on like that. Okay. And then I'm gonna start to pull it, pull it like this over the wall. You see, it really does not do anything to the charcoal when you work it this way. Now, the other thing that I want to do, I want to make sure that I um, cover the whole page because I don't want to see white. The white will interfere with my, my uh, judgment about the lights in the picture, okay? And then we're going to let this dry. It, it uh, doesn't take long to dry, depending on how much shellac you put on it. <laughs> A hot, very high quality. I'm using actually the, uh, the, the um, cover of the Bristol board. <laughs> No, I wouldn't use the bristle board because this doesn't take the, it's not taking charcoal, it's, 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 there's no tooth to it. So you can, I just let the, any heavy bond paper, generally smooth though. Okay, come on, let's get this going. Can I see if I can get this off of, I have a lot of shellac on here, so I might have to, do you have like a new, newspaper or something, or some kind of pa other paper that I can just pour this on? Oh, yeah. Actually, let's do this, let's do this, let me do this, oh, I got it. Yeah. Now, you know, um, the other thing is that, you know, um, I don't know if you, you the, um, Rubens used streaked grounds. Have you heard that? Okay. Streaked grounds. In other words, see how this is streaked? He would, he would have a streaked ground. And he would do that because he didn't want the, uh, he didn't want to build out from the ground. He wanted to build uh, into, around a, tra a transparent ground. He, it, was, it helped him to sort of see, construct the form in space, you know? and to lay his light on to sort of see this balloon of a thing, transparent balloon of a figure, you know, with the light on it. Um, and Van Dyck uh, did the same thing when he worked with Rubens. When he went to England, Van Dyck, um, the, the fashion for 
portraiture was a little different there. It was, it was, it was a little more um, uh, severe and, um, and stiffer, you know, more opaque. And so he began using a, uh, a solid ground. So if you look at the early paintings of Van Dyck, they have that a Rubenesque quality to them. But when you look at the later paintings that he did in, in England, they have, a, they have a, a, a less of a transparent look to them. They're really built out from a solid colored ground. Um, when Rubens went to Spain and encountered, uh, you know, and, and met with uh, Velazquez, he had, uh, he had a pretty big influence on Velazquez. Velazquez began taking his, uh, the grounds that he would make and actually swirling the, the uh, preparation onto it as if he were already drawing the forms, you know, making a kind of a chaotic ground out of which order would come, you know? You know, um, we talk about the sort of the gradual evolution of an artist's style and, and technique. And, uh, you know, we always have that, that sort of scary model of Mondrian's trees that really become the sort of uh, the grid of his pictures. It's, a, it's almost a, almost a make-believe movement, almost as if he made it up so that it would look like he could demonstrate this movement too. Um, and so we have this idea that artists can't like uh, abruptly change course. But Velazquez at a certain point said to his father-in-law, or it's recorded by his father-in-law, I would rather be, his father-in-law was pa Pacheo, the, uh, the painter. And um, he said, I would rather be first in crudeness than second in finesse. Meaning that he didn't not, he, he was not going to compete in, in uh, the terms of Raphael and Titian, you know, they're, with what they're doing, he was going to make his own way. So if, I don't know if you've ever been to Spain, if you've ever seen Los Barachos in person, um, it's painted heavily and changes and the paint is sort of, has a kind of built up quality to it, you know, uh, like you see, Penta no, you don't really see Pentimenti, but you see him changing his mind. The paint is crude, the, painting, the paint quality is crude, you know, and, uh, and I was shocked when I saw that, because in reproductions it looks like, wow, it? but it's not at all like that. It's really heavy. But the f allowing himself to free, to be free that way with the paint and not be so overly concerned with this sort of, you know, uh, very delicate surface enabled him ultimately to create those remarkable pictures that sort of flicker before our eyes and make sense in space at, at a distance. You know, it freed him to be able to make those decisions about paint. You know, it's really, it's so weird, you know, during the Renaissance, a book was discovered in an urn in, uh, in Rome, and it was, uh, it happened to be a complete copy of the book On Nature by Lucretius. And Lucretius was a, uh, the, the, uh, was a student, he wasn't a direct student, but he was a follower in the sense of uh, Epicurus. And Epicurus, we don't have much of Epicurus's actual writing, just some fragments. But what's preserved in the, the, the book by, by Lucretius, uh, which is called On Nature, is, uh, is so valuable, you know? And we have the whole, the whole text. And uh, what's cool about it, 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 among many, many other things, is that he describes the uh, concept of optics that was, you know, prevalent in classical times and, and uh, and uh, really up till a time when Al-Hazan, the uh, Arab, the great Arab genius um, uh, who worked in, I think, the 10th century uh, in Northern Africa, um, did experiments with optics and was able to demonstrate that, that rays of light don't come out of the eyes and go onto something, but the light comes into the eye and forms a picture on the back of the eyeball. You know, and he demonstrated this. Uh, and his, uh, he had a, uh, 
massive influence on, uh, on the development of perspective and other things like that. But um, um, when you read Lucretius' account, the way things, the way vision was believed to operate was that rays come out of the eye and those rays actually uh, uh, peer into what, whatever you're looking at and the thing you're looking at begins to flake off like a cicada skin or a snake skin. This sounds very strange. These flakes then, these sort of pieces that come out, float in the air and merge with other things in other places. And so all sorts of combinations are made that are almost unpredictable uh, of things in the world, including dreams. Now, uh, what's very odd about that is that, uh, first of all, the idea that these things are flaking off. And you know, why would anyone believe that that's what was happening when you look at something? But if you wanted to combine not only the sort of science of optics or whatever rudimentary thing there was with how psychologically we look at something, I could say that I, I look at you and I don't know you, but the more I look at you, the more I understand a little bit about you. And then the longer I get to know you, I start to see things in you that I can understand because I see, I've seen them in other people, right? So these things, are, as this, you're like an onion, these things are flaking off into my consciousness, into my psycho psychological relationship with you that is uh, also forming other associations outside of us, you know, and coming back into my thinking. And so th it's a very interesting way of combining the psychology of perception and the, uh, the optics of perception, you know? And uh, even though it seems so, so foreign to us in this world, apparently uh, theoretical physicists now, I mean, some of the uh, work with string theory and things like that, are actually believing or f f trying to understand mathematically that this is actually happening. They don't go back to Lucretius, but they're creating theories about, about things that are out there around us that are logic is beyond our or a logical scheme. It's almost incommensurable. So these are incommens in, they're called incommensurables, like ways of looking at things that at the time seemed to be completely unreconcilable. And then it's further down the road tends to converge. You know, it happens very frequently, in th in, especially when Fire Robin, Paul Fire Robin writes about it in, in the, uh, in, um, and he was a, a philosopher of science along with Thomas Kuhn and Karl Popper, people like that. But he talked about the evolution of scientific uh, scientific thought and, and the nature of scientific revolution, you know, it's a very, it's a very curious thing. It, it, it also, you can think about it in terms of painting, in terms of art, and painting sort of like it becomes at a certain point a, uh, an anachronism, you know, and people say, oh, why are you painting? You should be doing these other things, but ultimately the things will merge at some point, you know, even though it may be incommensurable. It's probably not exactly the same thing, but... Um, I, I mentioned that because of Velazquez. When you look at a Velazquez painting, you get close up to it, and it looks like it's flaking off, you know, little shards of paint and flickers of things. But when you stand back, you know, at, uh, you know, 15 feet, the whole thing coalesces into a whole, into a, a perfectly plausible form, you know? Uh, but the action of that happening takes place between your eye and the canvas. In the space between you and the canvas, that's where it's happening, you know? It's not happening close up. It's happening at a distance. So this, it's in a sense Epicurean in regard to the optics because these, these flakes are, are moving off of the canvas. And in fact, we start to associate this sort of movement of those things with other things. Do you see how the expression in painting then uh, is like that? El Greco, a similar thing. They don't like form into a hole at a distance, but they form into something at a distance that may not be there when you get really close and look at the faces or something. Some of the really crazy ones, you know? Uh, but those, the, the uh, this distortion of those things actually produces a, uh, a f an effect within us that is sort of understood within us by associations with other things, like flame. For example, I look at El Greco and I'm seeing this thing and what I think of is a flame, maybe. So all of a sudden, I start to, I begin to associate the expression, uh, uh, the expression inherent in the painting of, of El Greco with, with fire, 
with flame. And then I can make my own judgments about uh, the relationship between the subject matter and flame. And then when I begin working on my own paintings and I start to merge the idea that I gleaned from El Greco and made sense of because of its association with other things, then I make my own work. But I've tended in the process of, I, I, I'm in a way celebrating what he did, but not copying what he did. And so I'm turning what he did into a kind of, uh, his method into an allegory. I'm allegorizing it, celebrating it, holding on to it so it won't slip away, making something of my own that is, you know, that refers to it, that, uh, that keeps the ball moving, you know, that he might have started, the balls that he started juggling, I'm picking them up from him, you know, in a different way. And it's, it's uh, the way, um, it's the way painting, painting moves, it's always in motion. It's not something that stops, you know? It's also curious how we, I'm saying this because I'm, wait, I'm talking because I'm waiting for this to dry. Um, it's also um, um, interesting how we develop as artists. There are like almost three stages of our, of our development. Uh, the first stage is that we look at a work of art that we love and we're moved by it, but then we have to figure out why we are, you know? So we look at the, the things that are present in the work and we, uh, we start to give them a name. We sort of name the things that are happening. Oh, this is what he's doing here. This is what she's doing, you know? Uh, and uh, in that sense, we sort of stop, stop the illusion. We, you know, when you stand in front of a painting and the painting, you're sort of bowled over by the effect of it, right? And, but in order to analyze it as an artist, you have to stop that being bowled over by it and say, how did that happen? You know? And so in a way, you've stopped the motion that painters always want paintings to have all the time, never to stop moving, you know? always to be captivating. You have to stop it. You freeze it, right? So then you kind of name what it is. You, you actually reify. You harden the effect, which is purposely kept in motion by the painter. In order to understand it analytically, you, have to, you, you harden it, you turn it to stone, and you think of it that way. And then the next thing you, we tend to do is want to imitate those kinds of things in our own work. You know, uh, So we take that thing that we've hardened and turn it into an allegory for ourselves, a celebration of that thing. All right? and, in that, and, and, and when we do that, our work is still beholden to to the artists that we love in the past. But eventually, in our development, uh, with all the complexities of influence, we start to find ourselves as original creatures, you know? And, and all of that sort of starts to flow into the invisible stream of, of the history of culture, the history of art. Um, there's an example of that with uh, uh, Philip Guston had said that when he begins a painting, his studio is filled with all the artists that he loves, and they're all watching him paint, you know? And he said, one by one, they start walking out of the studio, you know, until I'm the only one left in the studio working on the painting. And then he says, and then I leave. <laughs> and that's, that's the most important part, because when you leave, then you've just become, you've been, you've, you've been subsumed or absorbed into the stream of the history of art. You know, he's now outside the room with the other guys. <laughs> and the picture that he made is like almost a corpse, but it's still just, you know, it's, it's now become, it belongs to the ages. It does no longer belong to, it no longer belongs to him. He doesn't really have an effect on how it's going to really be, have it, uh, be perceived and how, what effect it will have in the future, you know? But uh, that's the kind of stuff is, is interesting to me especially because I try to figure out, what, you know, when you look back on, when we look back on our development over many years to figure out, this is how I started, this is kind of what I wanted to do, but then I kind of changed my mind, and uh, I went someplace else, but then in the end, I'm going back to some of the things I was originally interested in, you know, but I'm talking over a period of like, de I mean, maybe decades, you know, uh, and that hap could happen in a day too. You could start something in the morning and think it's really good. By the afternoon, you don't like it very much. By the evening, you run back to what you did in the beginning. But this, over, over a period of decades, it becomes interesting because all along the way, you're picking up other stuff. And when you finally come back to the very thing you wanted to do in the beginning, it's enriched by all this other stuff that you've happened to come across. Not happened to come across, you come across it because you're really looking for it. You're looking with intention, 
you know? When you read things, when we read things, you know, we, the best thing to do is to read with intention, not to just read willy-nilly. You know, so you want to study something about the history of painting or about painting or about what painters are doing. Don't necessarily just pick up anything and start reading it in the middle of it. You know, think about an idea you might have about painting and start reading theoretical material, whatever it is, that might explain to you, or not explain to you, but might be uh, in kinship with you about what you're interested in. You see, the effect of it is that now I've, uh, and now imagine if I had painted this whole thing. You could see it. Imagine if I had painted this opaquely with, uh, uh, opaque in the lights, opaque in the shadows, keeping everything really light, you know, and let it dry. Okay? Then I put this on top of it, or a color, a glaze on top of it. I've turned the whole thing into a transparency again. And now I can work on top of this as I would with, to try to focus on opacity and tr translucency to try to build the form. But at any turn, you can take something and render it transparent again, you know, in, in that sense. And in another way, you can, if you get too dark with something, like if I were to develop this and I got too black with an area of it, uh, if I took a color that, remind, that was reminiscent of the original ground and started dragging it over those dark areas, and in fact drag it into a lot of the shadows, the whole thing would appear to be transparent again. You know? So transparency, you can fake transparency, or you can reground, you can call it regrounding, you know, when you've lost the ground or you've lost the, trans, the, the luminosity of the piece or the remarkable transparency of the piece. You know, you can fake it. In fact, artists fake it all the time. Uh, um, Sir Charles Locke Eastlake actually describes the colors that he feels English painters should use, and it's raw umber and English red, the mixture of that, dragging that into the shadows that have gone dead on you, have gone, gotten way too dark. It sort of brings, the, it makes it look like the, you're seeing the ground through it again. You know? When we look at Caravaggio's, or some of these paintings that you know were developed over a long time with, a, with you know, a lot of activity on the surface, and we look in there and we say, hey, you see the ground in there, you know? You don't know whether you're actually seeing the ground or whether you're seeing where he regrounded it when he lost the darkness and lost the light in the shadow, mm -hmm. you know? It just reinforces the idea, Picasso's idea that, uh, that a painting is a lie through which the truth is revealed. And that, uh, and Degas' statement that, uh, the picture should be made like, uh, constructed like, the perfect, like a perfect crime. You know, he says, he says add uh, paint with all of the cunning and, uh, that you possibly, and, and whatever cunning that you, you, you have in you, and then add the accents of nature. So you see, the, the, when you think in these terms about art, you realize that any kind of imp empiricism uh, born of maybe English thought, and this is why a lot of the English painters are, uh, have held on to looking at something, observational painting, uh, because, you know, there's a tradition of, a, I guess it from, comes from Hume, or the, the empiricists who, you know, believe that if they didn't see it, if they didn't observe the thing happening, then how could I speculate about it? If it's, you know, how can I even develop a theory about something if I'm just, if it's something that's untheorizable? You know, uh, the empiricists had to see it. The eye became very important. I'm going to see it, and then I'll know it. I know that rock exists because I just hit my, stubbed my toe on it. You know, I think uh, someone once said. But uh, <laughs> that is very true about scientific method. You know, it's essential to scientific method. But it uh, is not so great for painting, for art, because art's doing a different thing, investigating a different thing. And the means by which it, the means that it uses to investigate those things are not always empirical, you know. Uh, so you, I think that the tendency for people to just work from the model, or work from photographs, you know, they say work from you work from life or do you work from photographs? And they say, oh, I work from photographs. Oh, I should work from life. Or do you work from photo, uh, You work from life. Uh, you shouldn't work from life. You know, use photographs, you know. Uh, but then you ask them, do you ever look at a painting and work from a painting? like you're having trouble with an arm. So you go to the photograph or you go to the model, but you never look at how an, the problem of an arm was solved by a painter. 
God forbid. I don't want to be like that, but I'm going to imitate them. I've got to be original. I have to actually see it in an empirical term. You should look at the way a painter solved the problem. And then you, get engage, you engage yourself with the, the, the thought of painting, which is not the thought of, of observation necessarily, of merely copying what's in front of you and doing a damn good job. Even these, a lot of these uh, you know, British artists, you say, you nailed that one, mate. You know, you close, you get the point there and the point there, you nailed that one, mate. You know, I love, I love some of these painters. I mean, Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon, you know, especially Bacon, you know, he stands outside of that tradition. But if you go to the you know, studio school in, in, in New York, and Graham Nixon teaches a method of drawing that you see all throughout England. I see it in England when I was teaching in England. It's a sort of linear sort of looking at the thing, looking at things, keeping your eye on it, almost like contour drawing, you know? watching it move. And you see it in Lucian Freud's early work where he's like looking and looking and looking. Stanley Spencer's work, people like that, you know? Um, but um, you don't see it in Michelangelo or Leonardo or you don't see it in, uh, in Rubens. You don't see it in Velasquez. You see it a little bit in Velasquez, but not so much. You don't see it in Caravaggio because Caravaggio looks like it's absolutely real, but it's not really real. It's not, they're not real. It's not real. It's not what things look like really in the world, you know? These, in other words, I'm saying that these paintings are inventions. Gosh. These are inventions. Inventions of the mind based on material picked up visually, that we see visually, but they're constructions. Now, even talking like that is anathema to a lot of thought regarding, you know, what pain, how painters should develop. I'm talking about artifice from the get-go, learning how to make an artifice that looks like it's totally plausible, you know? You can make it look plausible or not plausible. In any event, what you're making is a window, you know? You're looking through a window. The window is either more transparent or less transparent, but everything is seen through a window. If you look at someone like Antonio Lopez, the window is more transparent. If you look at someone like Manet, it gets a little thicker, a little denser. And then you start to look at like Lucian Freud, and it gets even denser. You know, you look at Picasso, and it gets denser. Then you look at anything, a Mondrian, and it's sort of like changed. The, the, you know, you're looking through another kind of window, another kind of screen. It's all representation, whether it's abstract or figurative. It's all representation. No. <laughs> You got, I hope you got this on film. <laughs> Hush, little <laughs> Okay, it's getting dry now. All right. Okay. Uh, just the, now, the paper is, if I used a, th a, thick, a thick paper on, on this with, without that printing on the back, it generally stays flat. It doesn't, like, do this wobbly thing that... You know, shellac does that, that, you know, if you gesso paper, you have to stretch the paper before you put gesso on it, otherwise the paper starts to crinkle like that, right? But it, with shellac, it doesn't happen. And sometimes you, want, you can shellac one side and shellac the other side, too. So it doesn't, uh, so that you get the same tension on both sides and it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, the first thing I do before the model is posing, I usually have a warm version of a color and a cool version of a color, okay? So, um, you know, you can have a cool red and a warm red. So I would say that, uh, and you can have a, a very warm red. So you've got like burnt sienna and mix it with white, take a look at it. Take cadmium red, mix it with white and look at it. And then take alizarin crimson or some lake color and mix it with, mix it with white. Am I saying red? Mix it with white. Mix them all with white and look at them. You'll see warm, cooler, coolest. Okay? Uh, same thing with blues, same thing with greens, same thing with browns. Same thing with uh, yellows, same thing with all the colors. Violets, mix it with white and take a look at it, tint it, and you'll be able to tell the temperature differences. Okay, so it's, uh, I always want to have uh, pigment, p p uh, colors of, different, of, of, of both temperatures, at least, on, on the palette. At least two or three or four temperatures, depending on it. Like black, you know, ivory black versus lamp black. But the big differences, I go for bigger differences, like a cool black and ivory black and say a castle earth or a uh, Van Dyke brown. 
right? Or, uh, and then the other thing is that I always break colors, constantly break colors, you know, like broken color. And uh, I generally do, meaning that um, you mix a color with its opposite in order to, and with white also, to, in order to break the, the, in order to find, you know, middle, gr middle ground here and there, right? Um, so it's also called graying colors. They, they don't really turn to gray, but they, they, it, it knocks down the intensity of a color. Like for example, if you're using yellow or orange or something like that, and it's looking, a yellow for example, and it's just looking like, it's not a, a beautiful yellow and it's too glaring and wrong. If you take a bit of violet, you know, and you uh, mix it into the yellow or into with white, both with white and then together, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to modify the yellow. And then the thing that's beautiful about it is that you can almost organically or very naturally bring something that's more yellow into something that's more violet. So your, your transitions can, you can move from one color to its opposite and use that for light to shadow as well. You know, and then you'll find that maybe uh, as you're doing that, uh, you don't want to use the violet anymore because it's getting too violet everywhere in the shadows, but you need a kind of variation of that. If you use burnt umber at that point, it'll start to look violet to your eye, you know? And it'll operate, you know, opposite of, uh, uh, opposite the yellow uh, in, in some ways. Um, um, same thing with like uh, cool, cool black mixed with burnt, uh, with uh, uh, transparent red oxide. So I might start a palette by having white in the middle, uh, right? And it's always titanium that I use. I don't use um, cremants or flake or any of that stuff because, um, and actually Max Turner says that in, in his book that, uh, that um, titanium is one of the greatest inventions in painting in the 20th century. It's sort of a great, the greatest substitute for what they used in the past because it's uh, really opaque and it can be transparent. You can go from the, the, the run the full range, the dynamic range from opacity to transparency with, or uh, translucency it is, with, with uh, titanium. If you use a cremens or a flake white, they're already too transparent. So you can keep hitting it and not get the same opacity. The dynamics between opacity and transparency is really important. So everything in pain, painting is predicated upon opposites, right? Warm, cool, light, dark, transparent, opaque, soft, hard edge, uh, silhouette, passage, you know, um, open form, closed form. Um, so everything makes sense in painting by its opposites, by, by opposition. Just like language, if you go to a you know, grocery store and you want to make a fruit salad and you go to the, send the guy and go cherries, 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 the guy's not going to know what the hell you're talking about, first of all, and they'll probably call security. <laughs> but you can't make a fruit salad with that. Words, <clears throat> language works <clears throat> by differentiation. You know, um, cat and cap. They're close, but they're different. They mean different things. Or I can even say cat and then cat and then cat, and it could mean different things. In fact, you know, anyway, so you know what I mean? You have to differentiate. Everything's got to be differentiated. <clears throat> Soft brushes and hard brushes and, 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 and stiff brushes. You know, um, when, you, when a sculptor makes a, a, carves a piece of marble, what do they start with? They start with a pointed chisel. They move from a pointed chisel to a tooth chisel. They move from a tooth chisel to a flat chisel until finally they, pulver, they, they, they polish it. So you block it out with the pointed chisel. You adjust your, your forms with the, with the tooth chisel, and then you finesse the form with the... So if you start painting with a really soft brush and you're trying to blend everything all the time at every turn at every minute, you're, you're missing the boat. It's better to have a stiff brush in the beginning and lay the paint on, lay it on, get your opacity and transparency going. Okay, now, what I want to show you, I want to show you here is, um, uh, hit me a mail. I'm going to take warm colors, and, I'm, and uh, just warm color, and I'm going to make uh, a cool color, make a blue. And you probably know how to do this, but it's kind of something that is interesting because it, it shows the nature of a scumble and the nature of a scumble's capacity to form an optical gray. Okay, so right now I'm taking, um, <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to take, here I have yellow ochre, <clears throat> yellow ochre and white, and I'm mixing them together, okay? So I have 
I don't know if you, if you can see this on the camera. Can you see what I'm doing? It's hard to see. It's impossible to see. And you're probably not going to be able to see it, so it would be even better if you come up to the canvas and take a look at it if you can. But I've got a warm white, a warm light on my brush. <laughs> Nothing up my sleeve. Okay. <laughs> then I, I put it onto the, onto, the, onto the canvas, right? Onto the color. Now it still looks warm. It's as opaque as it could possibly be, right? It's warm. But then I do this to it. And I made it blue. Just, just using the warm color. But it's blue. It turns cool, like that. Now, yeah. now and in, in the simplicity of this, you see almost one of the biggest features of painting in the West, you know? Being able to create a skin that moves from light to half tone, you know, without having to mix. All right? At least for the time being, in and of itself, for the rest of the painting, if I keep doing that, always trying to preserve that thing, I'll go crazy and it won't work. And also it'll look really mechanical and kind of like German painting when they're trying to imitate the Italians and the Renaissance. It's like hardened everything. It's sort of like every turn is the same, goes to the same steel gray, that kind of thing. That's not what you do. You have to, you have to like get a sense of what that gray is and then later mix it with direct paint. There's two kinds of mixtures, optical mixture and atomic mixture. Optical mixture, as we know it from like the pointillists and the impressionists, is where you put these dots of color and then you stand back and they make another color, right? But optical mixture in the old sense was that you, um, um, you, you use layers of either a glaze or a scumble uh, to create a, a different color, all right? Scumbles tend to cool like that. Glazes tend to warm. So you can deal with your parameters of warmth and uh, coolness in part by using the optical mixtures of paint in that fashion. That's why we glaze and scumble. When Titian said, 30 or, I paint with 30 or 40 glazes, you ever hear that expression? Svelatura 30 or 40, he said. Um, he didn't mean that you put glaze on top of glaze on top of glaze, because you get black. You can't, he didn't mean that. He meant, in, there, I, I believe it's like this velatura and svelatura, are two different things. One is a glaze, one is a scumble. In Italian, if you put an S in front of something like cotto, cooked, you put scotto, it means it's not cooked or badly cooked, okay? So when he said 30 or 40 glazes, it's translated in English as glazes, he means glaze, scumble, glaze, scumble. So you're tacking like a, going in a sailboat across the river, up a river. You're going from side, then to side. You render something cool, you render the whole thing warm. You bring out the cools again, you adjust the warms. Now, you're not always doing it with glazing and scumbling, you're also doing it with direct painting. So indirect painting is 90% direct painting. There was a guy at the academy, it was Doug Farron actually, he said, uh, he said to Arthur da Costa, uh, uh, show me how to glaze, he said, and Arthur da Costa said to him, uh, you're too young to glaze. <laughs> And either he meant that nobody should glaze anymore, but that's not what Arthur de Costa meant because he was all about glazing, is that uh, he meant that if you can't paint directly, you can't glaze. And you should not even begin glazing a picture until you've gotten as far as you possibly can with direct painting on the picture. You know what I mean? If you do it with direct paint first, glaze is icing on the cake in some ways. And also glazes are not an end in themselves, so you don't end a painting with a glaze on it. Glazes are a means to an end, and, that, and, and it's a means to scumble. It, it brings you to the scumble. The scumble brings you to the glaze. They're never ends in themselves, okay? Very, very important, okay? All right, so now we can pose. Now, now for example, this is an example of you know, different colors being different. This is cadmium red is uh, so different than cadmium, uh, like a Winsor Newton cadmium red. So all of them are different. Stay away from Winton colors, okay? Don't ever use Winton. If you're gonna spend your money on something, you know, forego the beer and buy <laughs> Winsor Newton, not their student grade, because they, they don't have the pigment strength. And they don't do, if you have lousy paints, that's another example of the medium, the, ma the materials actually fighting you, you know? Uh, sometimes the materials won't do 
what you want them to do because they're lousy materials. So you can't get familiar with the kinds, types of colors you want. They're transparent colors and they're opaque colors and then they're super opaque colors like the Mars colors. Okay, now another thing that happens in, in painting in my, in when I do paintings or work, help work on students' paintings is they always say to me, do you see that as the color? Because they're always, we're always like brainwashed to think they have to get to the color as fast as possible. Like we had that four hour study where you nailed it, you know? Uh, it, that's not the case. I usually see them, they say, you're seeing that as green. I see it as kind of warm. And I say to them, look, it looks much more like what was out there than the blank canvas did. So <laughs> in other words, you know, you move toward making it look more like it. But you don't, you get it so soon and your picture's finished. You think Vermeer did those things in one skin, you know? Yeah, he didn't sort of like work over it and over it and then hold off on something or paint something in one color anticipating that he was going to paint over it another color, you know? You have to think in those terms when you work and not get so strangely obsessed with Okay, now, when I pull this, this light over here to here, oops, oh, mistake. Okay. And then I start hitting it like this. I can turn the form to gray already. All right, without putting blue in there. And that operation takes place everywhere. But what I really want to look at mostly is the uh, find the incidence of reflection. Now, the light is so bad in doing this right now that I'm having, I'm having difficulty seeing it. But it'll, it'll be OK. It'll be OK. We'll get there sooner or later. And instead of using my fingers, I could do this. But one of the first things I do when I begin working in a study like this is that I see, try to see immediately what the parameters are between opacity and transparency, and what color my transparency, uh, my, trans my scumble is going to make, what, uh, what's in, going to be the nature of the optical gray, OK? And as I move away from the center of the light mass, I'm, my paint is thinner for the time being. I'm, I'm observing this violet that's occurring. And I'm using that as uh, the color, the, the form, uh, as the form moves away from the light, the center of the light. Ultimately, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that as my clue to what the, how I will begin painting the background. Because that color is a reflection of something going on in this room, of the, a general principle of color in the room. And it gives me a clue as to how to, what, where, where I should go with the color that way. Hard to see, isn't it? There's, there's, not, there's really not much light here to be able to differentiate the brightest lights, but I'm going to try to do it. In general, in, in paintings, you know, you've heard the expression, load your lights and thin your darks. You ever hear that expression? Are these just expressions that we heard at the academy, but you don't hear them anymore? Is that um, if you're going to have texture uh, for the time being, or for the texture in your painting, try to keep it in the light masses. And try to keep the, the, the uh, shadow and half lights not so smooth, but less gnarled than the light mass. Okay? When we look at things, we generally tend to skip over the shadows. Our eyes don't really dwell on the shadows. We, we dwell on where the light is striking something. 
So the light then gets more of an, as, uh, the paint should activate the light in terms of its texture more than, more than the shadow. Okay, it's very hard to differentiate. You, need, you know when they say use natural light? A lot of people say, well, I'm going to have the model in natural light all the time. But it's really your canvas should be in natural light. This is, this is, uh, this is a, a ins an insanity to paint under this light. Can we shut this off? Can we turn another light on? You know, they said they went to visit Titian in the studio and he was painting with his fingers. He painted with his fingers all day. He wasn't painting with brushes. This is what he was doing. It's Titian. <laughs> oh, fuck you, Titian. <laughs> Don't ever call me. <laughs> Told him never to call me in this century. Uh, ha, 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 ha. OK. Now, even. This is okay. So, I'm, you know, when you paint with your fingers like this, you, I'm actually trying to get the full dynamics of the opacity to the transparency, okay? And um, that's another good reason why, not to, why one shouldn't use white lead. It's, of course, it didn't affect Titian all that much because he lived to be really old. But... Now, I, I'm doing this rather gently, but this process can be as vigorous as you want it to be. You can uh, imagine Willem de Kooning scumbling over his black paintings and turning, making excavation or attic, those paintings, you know. Uh, it's, they're scumble paintings, you know, or Max Beckman's The Night, you know. Uh, they're painting ferociously on it, but the effect is still present, you know. I, I'm happy, I happen to be working a little more delicately with all of this at this point. Now, there are a couple of things that, uh, uh, right now, I'm just sort of accentuating the fact, the, the effect of the optical gray. Very soon, I get incredibly bored with that. And uh, uh, also, it starts to look really not anything like what I'm seeing. I can't do this. I cannot do this. I give up. This is wrong. Um, all right. How, f how close is someone's studio? where they can get me some real color. Close, real, a minute. Could you bring me, could you bring me raw umber, burnt umber, uh, and terra vert? All right, just raw umber and burnt umber, that'll, that'll do. Cazzo è questo, ma che cazzo colori? Questi colori sono, questo è stronzo, hai capito? Ma fanculo. All right, okay, enough of the Italian shit. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going for broke here. Do you ever start with a, a, a more and more intense color, like a, a Venetian red or a, a really cold green? No, no, red? never, 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 never start with, uh, I mean, I, I don't necessarily start like this either. I start all different ways, but I definitely don't start with big, strong colors for the most part. No, but I mean underneath, before you put your whites on. No, I don't want it too dark. It'll, it'll, paint becomes transparent, uh, oil paint. And if you're too dark, your paintings are going to blacken. With what? 
Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, that's what I do. I never draw with charcoal on the canvas. I always start it with paint. You're just doing this for your I'm just doing it for this. But actually, I, I, also what I would do is I would take a really soft brush and use uh, sepia-based, uh, shellac-based ink. And then uh, on studies, I'll just sort of like flap the silhouette in there and then start painting on top of that. Very rugged. This is one of the, you know, really ruggedly, not, not with the... Uh, I'm gonna pull a Joe Pro. I'm gonna pull a Joe Pro here. Hold on. Oh, thank you. What is this? Okay, now now we're cooking with gas. Now we're cooking with gas. All right. So earth colors. Mary, you're doing a great job. Yeah, you have to. I'm just being. I'm playing with you here, man. But but you know, don't ever do it again. All right. <laughs> Now, come on. No, oh, come on. All right, let me see what this does. Mama mia, these colors. Every time you use colors, they're different. Area. Questi colori are not good. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. it's probably better. All right. All right, now the liquid's there. Where's the liquid? It's in that little dish. Oh, okay, got it. All right. Okay, I can't remember what the shadow mask was. So, um, what? When you see me doing this, I might do this later. Uh, uh, one of the things that, I, that you, you look at, even from the beginning, are edges. You don't save them until later. So I need to establish these all sorts of differences, crispness, hardness, opacity, transparency. Uh, I need to get it going from the beginning, you know, and to know where, for example, what's the nature of the break between the light and the shadow. I want to get it in there as soon as possible. Nice try, though. <clears throat> Good save. No, no, thank you. I, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Everywhere when I paint an arm, for example, <clears throat> I might slash the paint in there like that, but immediately I want to look at how the light crests on the arm. <clears throat> I want to get that as soon as possible. And I'm not so much concerned about matching the color exactly yet, but I'm interested in creating the form. The form is the most important thing for me. And you can see I'm, I'm staying away from touching, from getting to the over the, going over the transparency too fast. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to retain it for a little while. And even, even if I paint directly into the shadows, like I'm doing now, I'm aiming still toward imitating the ground color a little bit so that it re it, I keep before me this illusion of the, um, of the um, transparency of the thing. Now, when I want to go beyond, <clears throat> beyond the, 
the figure to the background, I'm going to look to these grays to give me a clue as to how I should do them. Now, even at this point, I'm going to pay, I have to pay attention to that edge, you know? I really have to pay attention to how it, how it rounds the bo the, uh, in from, in from the gray, from the... I can't talk in pain. There are slow turns and fast turns. You know, when you do the charcoal on the paper or the pencil, you press hard, then you lighten up, you press hard. You get a, a line with dimension to it. The line that you're making is indicating a, turn, a rapid turn or a slow turn. You know. So, but I want to accommodate that stuff in the in in the underpainting. You know, there's so much to say and so little time to say it. But the edges, people like will get to the edge and they'll start to uh, fuss the edge. All edges of things begin in the center of the light in the mass. All, the, the form resolves itself to the edges, okay? You don't paint it and then paint the edges and make the edges soft or something like that, you know what I mean? You have to think of it as the form rolling away to the limits of the, of the form. All edges begin inside of the form, okay? So basically what I've, the only thing I've been setting up right now is I'm trying to focus on where the, where the light mass is. I'm changing the temperature, making sure the temperature is different in in the light mass. At this point, I'm making it cool, but I know that the incidence of reflection is going to be here, and that's going to be cool. The light. Here's some presents. Oh, you are a darling. You are a darling. All right. Dirty green? What's that all about? Dirty green. Bizarre. Okay, so anyway, um, <clears throat> so. I'm establishing a kind of uh, system of differences uh, in the beginning of this painting. Some dirty green back there. This is dirty green. <laughs> it's called dirty green. Uh, yeah, it uh, uh, probably is in there, but I'm going to just keep going with this for, for now because I'm starting to get a handle, a little bit of a handle on this. Okay. Thank you so much. Now we're, now we're good. It's amazing that the, it's not just getting familiar, getting used to the paints, certain brands of paints. It's that they really operate differently. They mix differently. They blend differently. Uh, Do you buy your paint from Robert or Douglas? No. I go to just an art supply store and I get like, a, like Windsor, Windsor Newton, uh, Old Holland sometimes. Uh, you know, I, uh, hold on, hold on a second. Um, you know, it's Rembrandt, that sort of thing. Now, one thing I, I, that happens in, uh, as you move uh, to the edges of the light mass is that things get dimmer and they get warmer before they hit the turning before the turning occurs. And, and, and the turnings are not always the same. 
Okay, if you make them all the same, they will look really pl um, plastic. But as you move away from the, uh, the, as you move to the edge of the light mass, the periphery of the light mass, it gets dimmer and warmer. Dimmer and warmer as you move away from the center of the light mass. Now I'm going over that optical gray. Probably hitting it, hitting it in the wrong place, but it's all right. So, what's that? Yeah, it's, it's a, it becomes a warm gray. It takes away some of that, that uh, steeliness to it, you know? But you see, it's funny because this operation is so fluid and it's so unschematic, you know, that it involves, you know, all the cunning of painting, you know? You, you do it, then you fake it. You do it and you, you obliterate it. You just keep working the surface until the, this while keeping this illusion in your eyes. The minute this illusion disappears from your, your vision, then you, you're, um, you're in trouble. So you gotta try to hold it there, and, and the minute it goes out, like for example, I put that dark there before, and I was destroying the effect. So I had to wait, and then we got the red, and I was able to mix uh, a richer, richer, color more akin to the richness of this because I, I realized that I'm straying too fast away from the transparency of this field and I want to like keep it all you know the illusion going going I'm eventually going to paint over that eventually the whole thing every part of this will be covered you know I will not get there today but the um, but um, but you know what I'm saying you got to keep the illusion in your in your eye I say like indications of color. And the thing that's like kind of nice about, you know, studying like this, and these are really, this is just studying, uh, is that you could take all the time in the world to do it, and you could be at the kitchen table doing it you know, in the evening, and just fool around with the paint. Let it, let it do remarkable things, you know? Uh, play with it that way, you know? And, and uh, learn to see how you can create all sorts of optical colors, and then spend uh, as much time as you want developing the drawing, the drawing, the modeling. You know, again, you know, Joe Pro would be here in like, you know, 20 minutes. They would have this thing, you know, and everybody would be going, wow, bring Joe Pro back. We need more Joe Pro. <laughs> but I am not Joe Pro. And I really, I don't know why a person needs to rush a picture. Now, in an area like this, what if I were to take the gray again? Just <laughs> got burn number. Here's your tear of edit there. And some other stuff. Get Mar take Mario's job, will you? <laughs> get out of here! Oh, I'm joking, Mario. You know I'm joking. I love you, man. I love you, I love you, man. Okay. All right. So um, I'm glad we have a lot of brushes here because I keep mixing bad colors on my brushes. Bad colors. All right. I want to try to uh, take uh, that. What is that? Did I put the black out? I didn't put the black. Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre. Damn. Oh, Rublev. It's a cool company. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, 
Yeah, they make Velasquez medium too. There's stuff called Velasquez medium that's calcite ground into linseed oil. Don't try that at home. You can do it with the soft lids, but with the hard lids, you break your teeth. Hmm? I do that too. And it's, tasty, it's, it's tasty too. Vanga. I mean, he, he knew a good. He knew. He knew a good nosh. That guy. Lead white. <laughs> okay. Now, um, sometimes you find that you have, you have to mix the um, mix your optical grays. Okay, so that you fake them. So certain colors work really well to do that. Like a, um, a, a kind of a Payne's gray will work. Or a, um, uh, you, you have to experiment. Like this is very, this is a kind of gray that will look like that optical gray, right? So I'm able to, you know, fake the optical grays in places so that they don't all look transparent like that. The model's not really there. Anymore. I mean, the light is so different now, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Now, I, I know I'm doing this rather rather crudely, but I want you to just know that every mark that I put on at the peripheries of the light mass, you know, are reinforcing the, the, this, the structure of this light mass. So when I go, I know the color changes down here and it gets kind of reddish uh, and violetish, right? And using that red to actually tone down the white. So that I'm, or, yeah, to tone it down. Instead of like mixing a black in there or some other color. You know, just the red itself on the white is going to be darker than that. <clears throat> so it keeps, even though I don't lose color or lose illumination, I, uh, I keep reinforcing that this is going to be the center of my light mass. So, so a, lot, a lot of what is done here is indirect, is direct. <clears throat> now I remember that this sort of did. This sort of did that, if I recall. I'm sort of painting out of my, my memory now because I, I know the light has changed so significantly. actually go to this. Now, when I make this cooler, see, it, it automatically makes my eye want to see this even warmer. You know? So, this is why colors are, 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 very, are, are, are um, considered uh, unstable, because you can change the nature of a color simply by putting a different color next to it. So you have to actually have the sense that you have, you have to, uh, you have to, it's like juggling a bunch of balls at the same time, you know? Or like playing three-dimensional chess. because you have to be attuned to how the color looks, you know, at the same time as you're trying to make it be a certain thing.
Are you okay? Yeah, can I break for a couple minutes? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, I don't know, really. I don't know. I, I um, had stuff on the brush, and I sort of oh. stuck it in. See, now, that's what happens. You just start knowing what, what, what you're grabbing for. Yeah. You're not really thinking about a lot of that stuff. But, you know, I wind up adjusting this and that. And then, like, taking that to real dark, but then lightning here to create the silhouette again. So going back and forth and playing with this until all of the colors, you know, kind of resonate properly. And, you know, now I, I sense myself, I sense myself, uh, recognizing things getting too dark for me. Like, for example, those shadows, you know? And then it, rather than, um, I don't know, rather than keeping this darkness in the background, you know, I, I, I lighten that and then lighten here even more to create the sense of that silhouette, <coughs> you know? Okay? So, um, the end result is that I'm always veering in the direction of keeping the picture light in this underpainting. Taking my shadows up really light. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes we, we get real nervous about edges, uh, the edges of a form. It has to be delineated more. We have to keep outlining it, you know, and we get afraid when the uh, edge, the color of the edge, the value of the edge gets too close to the thing behind it. That is essential, an essential, uh, you know, uh, quality of paint that um, there are silhouettes and there's what's called silhouette and passage. You know, in passage, the value of the background, so the value of one thing gets very so close to the value of the, the thing in front of it that if you squint your eyes, they dis the line disappears, you know? And uh, a lot of times you see that in shadows uh, because that's what shadows open up to have the background spill into them. And you get like open form there in the shadows. Um, but a silhouette and passage are very important um, from the get-go in painting. You know what I'm saying? You got to sort of like start identifying those things as being parts of the per, you know the parameters of of uh, of verisimilitude. So you see, I, I will continue correcting this drawing as I paint it. As I paint the picture, I'll continue correcting my drawing. I, I won't necessarily be so, uh, you know, hell bent on, on getting it just right at the very beginning of the picture, because I, you know, because I think as, if I work on it, as I work on it, I want things to do. 
You know, and I know that I'm going to be painting over it and over it and over it and over it again. So um, I, I feel like I have to be able to land on my feet every time. And, you know, so if I start with a, a drawing that is, is too perfect, then I, I know I'm going to have to destroy it to advance the painting. You know what I mean? Lowering that. I mean, I don't know if I should lower that, but I'm going to. You know, anyway. And the importance of, try, of trying to get to the edges of things as soon as possible is that you, you, you need to work the edge into wet paint, you know? <clears throat> you can't, it's hard to work the edge into dry paint. No, you can't work the dry paint. You're gonna, if it dries and you've got to work on the edge, you've got to paint again what's on the other side of the edge so that you can really manage the edge. I'm having a, you know how you have bad hair days? I'm having a really bad drawing day. It's unbelievably bad. I can't, I can't get this fucking thing right. Looks like she looks like she's. I don't know why it looks so weird. <laughs> oh, this is great. Joe Pro blows it in front of a large audience. It's awful, it's awful, it can't be worse than it is. Do you ever have those moments when you're working on a study or something and then like you kind of overdo it and kill it? That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> no, 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 I would say that. Do you ever get that sort of like problem when like, you're overworking something and you're like you can't let it go when you have to? Oh yeah, yeah. That's 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 that becomes a real problem and you just refuse to let it go. But it's really worse when it's a study, it's worse when it's a painting. Right. You know, like I, I, I remember working for months on this huge triptych, you know, and I couldn't get it right and I would not let it go. You know, I just would not let it go. And uh, I got more and more depressed and then finally I kind of finished it, but not like Robert Henry says, like a man going over the top of a hill singing. I, I did it uh, with, you know, agony in my heart, you know, and total disappointment and hatred for myself and all of this. And, uh, <clears throat> but like an idiot, I brought it to the gallery and they, uh, they had it there for a while. And uh, I said, just send it back to me, you know, eventually, I, I hate this painting. So I had it in my studio. Then I get a phone call from uh, the gallery and they say, we have a Canadian buyer for your painting. And 
you know, it was a large painting, so we're talking a painting that probably at the time would have sold for uh, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, maybe eighty thousand dollars. So it was a big painting. It wasn't a giant painting, but it was big. And so um, he said, "Do you still have the painting there?" And I said, "Yeah, yes, I do have the painting here." And um, uh, so I get back to you, and I went over to the painting and unwrapped it and took a knife and just <laughs> ripped it to shreds. Now, I wish I hadn't have done that because I couldn't really use the money, but no. <clears throat> but you know, it's quality control. It, it really is qual it's qual it's No, it's quality control. It's really true. It, you know, um, a man walked up to, um, to Giverny with a painting under his arms that he had bought years ago. But it was unsigned, but it was a Monet. So he went to get Monet to sign it. He said, uh, asked his master, is this, and oh, he, he's approaching Giverny, he sees this column of white smoke coming up. This is a true story. And um, he goes there, and, and Monet's burning his paintings. And um, <clears throat> he says to him, uh, Monsieur Monet, is this, uh, I bought this painting years ago, is this one of yours? Uh, and is this your painting? Can you authenticate this? And Monet looked at it and said, yeah, it's mine. And he threw it on the fire. <laughs> and the guy, the guy said, I paid money for that painting. Why did you do that? And Monet said, go into my studio over there and pick another painting out for yourself. You know, quality control. There's another story. And these are true stories. A whistler went, was invited, sold a painting to this person and hated the painting. He just hated the painting. And he tried to get the painting back, but the person wouldn't give it back to him. You know, he couldn't even buy the painting back from the person. So he was invited over to this person's house for a, there was a party going on, and he um, uh, pretended he was not feeling well, because he knew the painting was in the bedroom. And he said, uh, uh, do you mind if I lie down? No, 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 just go in there and lie down. So he went in there, he took the painting and threw it out the window. <laughs> Another thing is Brahms destroyed a lot of his work that he thought was mediocre. You know, you destroy this stuff because you, you, um, you don't want it to outlive you. And one of the, I, that's why I, I give like the lecture last night. It's like looking at some of that stuff, I wish that I, I didn't show it. Sold it, it's, you know, never even done it. But. taking the background and I'm using it to inform some of the turnings now, the half tones. Turn to lighten the shadows <clears throat> because I know that later I'll darken them again. But if I don't have that light in there, that's going to go black on me, right? And how I lighten it actually is not by just sticking light in there, but I I've worked and I've found a color that I'm pleased with sort of of this, this background here. And I can use that color to lighten the shadows too, you know? And, uh, And I'm not going to move toward the, uh, so that once originally what was the, this color is now turning into this color because I've changed this color to this color. 
So if you want to put a figure in space and change the color of the background, you, better bring, you have to bring the color of the background then into the figure. But you don't bring it into the lights. You bring it into the half lights and the shadows. Okay, remember I was showing you the, the colonization of the form by light mass? It stops the reflective propensity. Where the light strikes it, it can no longer reflect the color of the room. And all of those reflective parts that can reflect just crowd back to the ghetto of the shadow and the half light. Okay? There, there you have it. And, you know, you see in Vermeer all the time, you see his shadows. Like, you know the woman pouring the milk in, uh, uh, pouring the, in the milk, the pitcher? The most beautiful part of that picture is the, the wall in shadow back there. And he, he, he's painting forever in that shadow. You never mistake that for anything but a shadow. But he can paint forever into the, the shadow because he's managed to keep it as light as possible, you know? through this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth kind of thing. And then letting it dry, and then doing it again, doing things like that again, you know? If I were to arrive at this figure fast, you know, it would be like, wow, you did a cool study. And so fast you did it. It's like, oh, it doesn't look like, it doesn't, if I brought it to a museum, it might look like an academic, you know, uh, a painting that a French academic did. Uh, not a great one either, just a study, a class study. It would look like everybody's class study. You know, these guys. But it would never look like a Vermeer, for example. It would never look like, you know, Rembrandt, an early Rembrandt. So that's why, that's why it's, it's important to take your time with these things. Do not talk too much while you're doing it. Now, another thing is that, <clears throat> and this is kind of important, is that if I start toning this shadow side down with this green, I don't want to tone the other side down with the green. The light side has a prismatic quality. It's toned down prismatically with prismatic grays and red, reds. And the other side might be toned down with greens or more earth colors, OK? So uh, if you do it on both sides, it winds up looking like a cylinder and very artificial. So um, that's, that's another thing. It's a subtle. So I would take then, say I would take a gray with red in it. To start turning down the side, perhaps. Let me see. Turn this down more prismatic.
no, I don't. I, it's very disturbing because it's too powerful. Uh, yeah, just I, I can't concentrate. But you know, it's weird. I can totally concentrate with a, a spoken word. Like if I listen to a book on tape, or I actually listen to this, old, this, this stu stupid old time radio. It's so dumb. You know, but these old radio shows from the 40s and 50s, and they occupy a part of my brain that keeps me like not from not getting bored, you know? But at the same time, they never interfere with what I'm doing. They allow me to zone out. Yeah. Yes. That's what it's named after, Avo Parts piece. Very good. Yeah, I, um, I like Avo Park. Yeah. But uh, I, there was one time when I did listen to um, a lot of mu uh, uh, music incessantly, obsessively, when I was working on a painting. I was working on that painting of the books, you know, cocaine, and I uh, was listening to Philip Glass. Uh, and uh, over and over and over again, listening to uh, um, his violin concerto, and then and this piece called Company, and then the um, prelude, the, the overture to uh, Akhenaten. And that really uh, helped me a lot with that picture. When you're working so like cars, do you premix your colors? Or? No. I never premix them. Uh, if oh yeah, if I if I, I finally arrive at what the color is going to be, and then I say I need I need to, a lot of this for now, you know, I mean to do a background or something like that. Yeah, I'll do I'll do that. But I I you know I never really know what colors I'm going to want or encounter, so I don't premix. Uh, I don't use the same palette all the time, same colors all the time, and generally, in a way, the same colors, but uh, similar colors. But I, it's hard to to, to know. Now you see, after all that, I'm going back to finding the incidence of reflection in this. And I'm using it, the paint actually to, to sculpt. Now, I know the drawing is not, is not right, and if I were doing this and I were unsatisfied with my drawing, dissatisfied with my drawing, I would uh, destroy it and start it again, you know, until it was exactly what I wanted. But I can't spend that time doing that here. So you just have to bear with me with the... Uh,
Do I have a what? Well, I get out of bed. I generally get dressed. Hit the bathroom, maybe. Now, um, a day, my daily routine, I, I, <clears throat> one thing that's really important to me is that um, the first glance of my, at my painting in the day is incredibly important. Uh, and it tells me in, immediately what I've done wrong the day before or what, what I've done right the day before, you know? And if I, when I see the painting for the first time and I, I see something wrong with it, I know exactly what I have to do. And if I wrong with it and I look at it for a few more minutes and it starts to look right to me, that, that's invariably a mistake. Because then I convince myself that it's OK. I, I will know immediately after the, at the first glance what's wrong. Did you read Blink? Did I read Blink? Yeah. Blink. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, this is a process that I'm sure everybody uses. I mean, you know, uh, Titian you know, he said he turned his paintings to the walls for months, and then he turned them around finally, and he said, I expected to find uh, jewels, I found garbage, you know. Uh, and uh, it's because you, you, you talk yourself into, uh, that's like when you were talking about the working on the painting, the study, and just not being able to leave it, and it getting worse and worse and worse, but you can't leave it. That, that's, that's what happens to you when you talk yourself into thinking that something is right. But there are also uh, times when you really think that uh, you can make it right. And uh, it's frustrating. Frustrating to blind yourself. So our con we're constantly trying to awaken ourselves to what we're doing, <clears throat> you know, to stay awake to what we're doing. At the same time as we're we're trying to um, uh, lose ourselves in the work. It's a very, very, uh, very difficult balance, you know. Gustin would always, or often talked about, if a painting came in too easy to him, he knew it was all wrong. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. And sometimes it's not true. Sometimes it, it, really, uh, it really does <clears throat> come out a lot faster than, than uh, you think it's going to come out.
trying, trying to keep the shadows as luminous as possible for as long as possible, you know? Um, Okay, are you getting a sense of this? Okay, <clears throat> I don't think I need to go much farther than this. I think I've hit upon all the issues with it. Uh, relationship of the color of the environment to the half-lights, uh, keeping the luminosity of shadows. Um, And, you know, I mean, right now the modeling isn't perfect, uh, especially down here, you know, but I could work on it forever, and, and I would, would. I would work on it until it, it, it worked, until it worked. But, you know, it, I would just be perfecting this, this thing, trying to perfect it uh, and spending all this time with you, um, wasting all your time. But uh, it, you get the sense of it. So a, a chromatic underpaint, a chromatic grease eye in the end would look like that, would look something like that. There's color in it. There's temperature shift from light to shadow. At this point, the shadows have a kind of neutral warmth, and the lights have a coolness to them. When this is dry, I'll pull a glaze over it, a warm-ish glaze, and all of the lights in the, in, the, in the body that are cool now will turn to warm. And now I have to go into the shadows and start to go over them again with films of thin paint with a soft brush and, and, and neutralize them again in relationship to the warmth of the light now. Okay? What you consider a warmish hmm? What would you consider a warmish Over that? When I put it, what I would put over that? I would probably put a, um, a, um, I, I, I use different things at different times. I really don't use burnt, like burnt sienna, something like that's way hot. But you could use all, uh, a lot of different things and experiment with them. Um, I, I would not put a cool glaze on there, but I would put a neutral glaze, like a Van, a Van Dyke brown that's made by Holbein. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I take burnt umber and break it with a little bit of uh, cold black or blue, ultramarine blue. Uh, also, you could use raw umber. Uh, that's kind of murky, though. It doesn't live. I, it's a, I try to pick a color that has a, a vitality to it, but not an overpowering heat to it, you know? And, uh, or an amber color again over the whole thing, a kind of not shellac. Now, the other thing about shellac is don't use it on canvas. Despite what I was saying yesterday, when you are doing, trying to imitate the color of that shellac on canvas, you can do it with raw sienna uh, acrylic. You know, you don't have to put it, you don't want to put that on top of oil paint, but if you want to tone your canvas amber, tone it with that. Shellac is brittle and it'll break uh, it, if you use it on a canvas, you know, it'll crack. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, when you, on a board you can use it, on a panel you can use it. On paper, it's kind of like a panel. But, you know, on a canvas that's going to be rolled and it's going to be like, you know, floppy and stuff like that, it'll, it'll just crack. Do you have a um, favorite brand that you like to use of paint? Um, <clears throat> there are different brands, there are different colors made by different brands that I like. Certain colors, like earth colors, um, you know, uh, you know Windsor, I use generally gravitate toward Windsor Newton and um, Windsor Newton, not Winton though, remember. Windsor Newton and uh, uh, Rembrandt colors. There are a few gambling colors that I use. Old Holland, a few Old Holland colors. These are really expensive. Um, 
I use a Holbein. The only a few paint, paints by Holbein, a few colors by Holbein. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Do you have a brush brand that you? No, no. I, I, I really I destroy my brushes. I, I you know I'm not one of those painters. You get to the studio and they've cleaned all their brushes nicely and all. They take good care of them. I destroy them. I often will just be working on the thing and just throw the brush on the floor and walk away and come back in, in the next morning. It's all hard. And I use, um, I use house painting brushes uh, for you know, big paintings, you know, and, uh, you know, Titian used brushes the size of brooms, they said, right? And uh, that was because he was, he was laying these large glazes over an entire surface, unifying the surface. So you unify the surface with the glaze, but then immediately you've got to start to um, work out of it, work onto it, either while it's wet or really better when it's dry. And then sometimes you're going to work wet on dry, and other times you need to work wet into wet, you know? Like if I'm doing, I was doing the, uh, modifying all these edges and uh, with the background, it has to be wet in the background in order to do it, you know? If it's dry, then uh, it's like an agony. That's fighting the materials. Yeah, that's like fighting the materials. That, so they're not, uh, they're not doing, you know, not working for you. Okay? With your larger when I do what? Like just your larger, more involved paintings. They're always on, uh, on canvas. So although uh, I have done some of them on gator board, you know, it's like a foam core, but it's it's acid free and it's really hard. Uh, I don't see an advantage to doing that. I just do it because I don't want to use. I, I just want to be as, be free with the materials and just experiment. And uh, but when I stretch canvases. <clears throat> I always paint my canvases on the wall, tacked to the wall. I never stretch them before I paint them. And uh, then I build the stretcher bars for them. And I build them so that I can attach gator board uh, on staple it with big thick staples, uh, long staples into the wood and uh, into the supports so that I have a flat, hard surface. And then I take, <laughs> take my canvas off the wall and lay it onto this and I stretch it around that. But you don't really stretch it. You stretch, you, you don't stretch, you stretch the canvas on the wall first. And you do the whole paint, I do the whole painting on, on that stretched. And then I uh, put it on that and staple it to, you know, or tack it to the, uh, the stretcher bars. It's really good, especially for large paintings to have a hard support underneath it because it doesn't, the canvas doesn't warp uh, and sag with the change of temperature, because if you've got something behind it, it at all points on, its, uh, on the back of the canvas, it tends to hold the canvas up, you know? And you don't glue it, you just sort of put it on. Are you using a double prime, an oil prime, or a, a fine surface, or a grittier surface? Um, I usually have not, like number 10 cotton duck. Uh, I, don't, I don't use linen, although I was, uh, and I don't prepare them myself. I mean, I, 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 I sometimes prepare them myself just with gesso. What I do is I'll put a coat of matte medium on it, sand it, I'll put a coat of gesso on it, sand it, put another coat of gesso on it and sand it, then put an imprimatur on it, uh, the, t the color that I want on it. Uh, but I also buy pre-primed acrylic primed canvas, you know. Um, and Antonio Lopez <laughs> said to me, you, sh you have to prepare your own grounds. And he said, when I come to America, I'll show you how to do it. Uh, he didn't like the fact that I was painting on acrylic ground uh, canvases. But, um, and I know when you paint on these remarkable surfaces, it feels wonderful to do. But I think, you know, if I keep building, as I build the paint, I, uh, I am then painting on these remarkable surfaces. You know what I mean? I don't need to start on a, remark a precious, remarkable surface that's going to make me feel like every mark is so beautiful. I don't want to destroy it. You know, I want to get it to the point where I, as fast as I can, so that then I can put the beautiful marks on it. And when I talk about that, I, this is like really not proper technique, proper uh, method. Uh, it's not something that you do because you want it to live forever. I don't think anything's going to happen to these pictures. I have a, 
sneaky suspicion that the materials I'm using are going to, to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> really tar pits, right? Yes. And the thing is, you know, you, you put this stuff on roofs or you use it to just tack these things and it's out in the sun and it's up there for years and years and years out in severe conditions or Rust-Oleum paint, you know? If you use Rust-Oleum, you leave the furniture out and it stays out there forever. And, and, and it's like, you know, what's, what's Irish and sits out on the porch all summer? Patio furniture. Uh -huh. Uh, because some of his paintings were falling apart. I don't think that's how he got to jail. He got to jail because he was doing something funny with taxes. Oh, is that what it was? That's yeah. what it was. Okay. Uh, yeah. So he's like, and they won't let him paint in prison, apparently. But he's not in prison. He's in, no. he's skipped yeah, town. He's going to speak next week up in Missouri. He is? Yeah. Arrest that man. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I won't read it. <laughs> no, uh, he wrote a, wrote a play. Uh, Odd Nurgen wrote a play, and they performed it uh, at the New York Academy, I think it was. And um, Donald Cuspert was there, sitting next to me, you know, looking at. It. Then he got up in the middle of the play and walked out. And later I said to him, "What? Um, Why did you walk out of the play?" He said, "I like my Ibsen in the 19th century." <laughs> It was like a, it was like Odnerzum was copying Heinrich Ibsen, you know. It's got I was like, I, is actually a, a, a neat guy, a really neat guy. I'm not I always like the big fan. He's done some beautiful paintings, but um, as a person, he's really cool uh, because he's he looks like he's insane. <laughs> but you look at it, I was talking. You talk to him, and he sort of has a slight smirk, and in his eyes, you see this laughter. Uh, and I realized, looking at this guy, this is like a, 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 a you know, 60s radical guy. You know, the look is not this caveman look. It's just this guy refuses to give up the, the 60s thing, you know? <laughs> Which is not, the, not just the look, but even his, uh, his uh, you know, his, uh, you know um, his position, the position that he takes, you know? This, this rebelliousness in him, you know? And he's not a... <clears throat> he's not an idiot by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he's a very smart man and powerful figure with a powerful ego, but also I hear very generous, very generous. So, you know, it's weird, you know, you, as, a, as an artist, you know, I could, uh, I have friends, best friends, and that who's, uh, whose work I can't stand or I'm not that crazy about. But I never would think of them in terms of their, you know, I mean, it would never affect my love for them uh, in the least. Um, but when it comes to actually being a painter, and I can't take, I, I take no prisoners, you know? I, I don't, I don't, I can't do it. It's a, it's a luxury to be able to go and say, oh, that was very interesting. You know, go to the gallery, that's an interesting, I can't. I go there and say, this is shit. I can't, I can't even be here. You know, I don't want to be here. I, and that's why Agnosium finally said, I'm not an artist. I'm not an artist. An artist has become something else. I'm, he doesn't say I'm a painter. He says I'm a kitsch artist, you know, which I don't like the word that he chose for it, but I can really understand why he feels that it's not being an artist anymore, what we do, you know? Art has gone on to be something else. Uh, and I really... I'm not that interested. Someone asked me, you know, which uh, contemporary painters I look up to, and there's so few. You know, I mean, Eric Fischel. Oh God, it was Lucian Freud when he was alive. Jenny Savile, Antonio Lopez, Cicely Brown, Mark Tanzi, and Neil Rausch. I actually like. Uh, and there are some, but there are not many, and I don't like, you know, go looking at them. I, I, I feel like a sort of like, a, wow, that looks good. You know, I'm going to do something good, too. <laughs> you know, it's not like, it's just weird. It's, uh, it's weird. I don't go to the galleries a lot. Uh, I just like to paint. I'm kind of hermetic, uh, you know, kind of like a hermit in a way. I just don't want to leave my studio. I spent hours and hours and hours in it, you know. I feel like I have one chance, you know, one life. What's, what is it? I, I don't, I'm going to YOLI. Uh, YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, you'll, you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pour YOLO, you know, and uh, you have this one chance to do to make some kind of difference if you can affect something or you know put your voice into the stream of the history of art. You only have a short lifetime to do it. So I, I mean, I made a decision early on that that's what I wanted to do. Even the first time I got married, it was more like, all right, I'll get married, just get it over with, so I can just paint. <laughs> And that went on for 30 years until it ended in divorce. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, uh, but in the second time, <clears throat> you know, with Roxanne, it's different. You know, well, let's get in there. No, <laughs> it's different. It's very different. Um, but, you know, it's again, it's like then they're, they're trying to balance it with being, a, you know, having a family. I have four kids and two stepkids now. And it's really hard. My first wife was a physician, so it wasn't as if, you know, I was painting and she was watching the kids. You know, we had to share everything. And it's really hard to find the balance in all of this. Uh, and the family then sometimes <clears throat> you get this constantly, Dad, why in the studio? Get out. You were painting yesterday. You know? And then they get older and then they become as compulsive as I am. You know? <laughs> like now this one who used to always say, Dad, you're such a perfectionist. Why don't you just get out of the studio? Now he just compulsively writes music. <laughs> You know, and a, has a band, and he's 18, but he's just like writing his own music, and he's got going on tour, and he's just like, and he's just obsessed. He says, "Now I know what you meant." Uh, he actually says it, and they get the lights go on, and the boys, it takes a while for the lights to go on. You know, ca we're, we're, we're cavemen for an extended period of time, uh, whereas the women, the girls, are like, man, burning up. It's like I have a little daughter now, and she's so friggin' smart. I just, I, I felt like I had to go to China to get a smart one, you know? <laughs> That's terrible, because she's really smart. And she doesn't stop, she's industrious. And you know, you know, one morning, she was 10, one morning uh, she said, Dad, I want pasta. And I said, oh, I'm not gonna make you pasta now, you know, uh, just you know, have some cereal or something. She said, no, I want pasta. And so she went to the cabinet, got flour out, put the flour on the table, made a little well in it, broke an egg, a couple eggs in it, started making the pasta. I said, well, what do you do? How did you learn this? I saw it on the internet. <laughs> she's 11 now, but she's like, so teaches her, so she taught herself how to sew. She's a kid who's biz biz bizarrely, you know, she, she never used, you know, she, she had a bike, and sometimes she'd ride around on training wheels, and they said, I don't want these training wheels on the bike. And you know, she, just for a very short time, she did that. And I said, well, all right, get on the two, the two wheel, take the training wheels off, and I'll, I'll hold the bike as you, as you go. And no, don't hold the bike. She got on the bike, started riding it. And then she comes, she stop, comes to a stop to get off. She, she hits the brake, and as the, it's coming to a stop, she swings her leg over to get off the bike. I was like, she never, I know I'm bragging about my kid, but it's like, I don't know where this kid came from, you know? I, I don't tell her to do her homework, she does her homework. With my boys, it was like, do your homework. Oh, Dad, come on. They were cavemen. And I told them when they were little, I said to them, you know, when you, uh, right now, you remember, see how happy you are? And when they're little boys, they're really full of life and this sort of thing. You're going to pass through a period where you're going to become cavemen. And you're going to like start growing, Dad, well, how was school today? Good. <laughs> and I, it's, it's, I, I said, this is going to happen to you. And I said, if you're really smart, you're going to pop out of the other side of that, and you're going to remember again what it was like to be a kid. And you're going to, the lights will go on, and you'll be happy, you'll, you'll, you'll have this. If you don't do that, you're going to wind up in some cubby hole, you know, answering phones, you know, and, you know, working for the man. You know, and then you, you, you'll be like, and I'll say, you're like so-and-so's father. They were adult, they're adults, they're old fathers. Hi, how are you? Where do you worship, Brad? You know, one of these things. <laughs> and, and I said, you just don't want to be that way. And, um, and now they popped out, and they're not that way. I'm really, really happy about that. But it took a long while. When the lights go on in the boys, they go on really bright. And they grow on aggressively bright. You know, and that's why they become sort of like these sort of frightening sort of, uh, you know, domineering characters. But, and the women who have been all along so incredibly smart, it seems, and just knowing all this stuff. And, and then they, they become even smarter again because they know that they have to be the reason, the sanity. And the men are insane, you know? And I don't know why anyone ever thought women were not the rational ones, and the men were. I think it's just the opposite, you know? I mean, I'm generalizing, but, you know, it's superior gender, women, dude. 
We're fucked. <laughs> We're fucked. <laughs> you know? I knew that a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I'm digressing. I hope you got something out of this. Yes. Yes. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.